You are listening to We Saw the Devil, an investigative and conversational true crime podcast that deep dives into fascinating criminal cases that are solved, unsolved, or ongoing. From America's Lori Vallow to Jeremy's Armin Mivas, we examine and discuss the world's most shocking cases. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to follow us online. Check us out at WeSawTheDevil.com and we saw the Devil on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can become part of the show by backing us on Patreon. Hello, everyone. You are listening to We Saw the Devil. This is Robin, and today we have a true crime roundup. So much stuff is happening in the world of true crime right now, like as far as cases, arrests, trials, NFL players getting arrested for assault. We have the literal dump of documents from the Lori Vallow case about a week and a half ago. There's movement in the Pam Hupp case. And spoiler alert, that's actually going to be another case that we cover every single piece of. I am obsessed with the Pam Hupp case. She's, she's terrifying. She's definitely not someone that I would want in my life. So much is happening that I just had to do an update episode so that I can just get all of this out of my system and have someone else to talk to and discuss it with. But before we get into it, let's just do some quick housekeeping. First, you can find us at wesawthedevil.com and we saw the devil across all social media. If you would like to support the show uh, financially, get to know us a little bit more personally, or even possibly come on the show as a guest to discuss your favorite case, please consider joining our Patreon. Whereas for little as $3 a month, you can get ad-free episodes, cool swag, merch, stickers, t-shirts, postcards, and a cool Facebook group where we discuss a variety of true crime cases. July's postcards just went out at the tail end of this week, so sign up now and get in on August. And finally, please consider taking 30 seconds out of your day to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do for any podcast that you love and adore or subscribe to. It literally means the world to us. But enough about all of that. Buckle up and let's get into some news. Do you guys remember the case of Joel Guy Jr., the Knoxville, Tennessee man who dismembered both of his parents and then set his house on fire um, and had his mom's head boiling on his stove? Yeah. Well, we have another somewhat similar case out of Wisconsin. At least I'm getting major vibes and it's absolutely horrifying. Bart and Krista Halderson, 50 and 53 years old, respectively, were last seen alive in their home on July 1st. The next day, Krista didn't show up for work. Sounds familiar, right? On the 7th, Chandler Halderson, their 23-year-old son, called the Dane County Sheriff's Office to report both of them missing, claiming that he hadn't seen them since the night of the 2nd. The next day, on July 8th, a human torso was found in a cottage grove field near a wooded area. And it just so happened that that was also the exact same spot where Chandler had been seen driving in reverse with a back hatch of his car, his hatchback open. The medical examiner was able to confirm that the torso was in fact Bart Halderson, his father. And so Chandler was promptly arrested for providing false information in a missing persons investigation. Then, this past Monday, things got pretty real pretty freaking quickly. Uh, He was charged with three additional felonies. Mutilating a corpse, hiding a corpse, and intentional first-degree homicide. And according to the probable cause affidavit, Chandler initially told police that his parents were going to be picked up by a friend of theirs, who was unknown to him, he had no idea who this friend was, with the intention of going to the family cabin in White Lake to attend a, a Fourth of July parade. Now, he also claims that he did not hear from them after his mom texted him with those plans. So police checked in on this as they, you know, tend to do in uh, in investigations. And it turns out that there was no parade in White Lake. So police's current belief is that Chandler shot his mom and dad before dismembering and then disposing of them. So this past Wednesday, Chandler waived his preliminary hearing during an in-person appearance in the Dane County courtroom. Uh, The judge then proceeded to schedule the date for his arraignment. And as we all know, the arraignment is where you formally enter your plea. And this arraignment will be on Friday, August 13th at 1.30 p.m. And what I always find interesting is when cases are moving rapidly. So I actually wrote uh, this outline of the cases that I'm going to cover last week on last, last Tuesday. 
And as of last Tuesday, uh, sadly, Krista Halderson, his mother, had not been found. Uh, she was still considered a missing person. However, just two days ago, on July 30th, so Friday, the remains of Krista Halderson were found in the nearby town of Roxbury. She, too, had been decapitated and dismembered. So as a result of that, the Dane County District Attorney's Office plans to add a second count of first-degree intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse, and hiding a corpse to charges against Chandler Halderson. And beyond that, guys, there is absolutely zero additional information coming out about this case. So I can't help but wonder and speculate about the motive. Is it life insurance? Uh, history of domestic issues such as abuse? The Joel Guy Jr. case is still so fresh in everyone's mind, and it's hard not to draw some kind of parallel to it or have your mind go there almost immediately because it was just so horribly sad. But the only information we have so far in this is that Chandler is a recent technical college graduate in computer technology, uh, and he also worked as a lifeguard and a teaching assistant. That's, that's literally all we know so far, but I am definitely going to be keeping tabs on this case because that is just so brutal and I just can't even imagine. Okay, so this next one. If you're like me and you frequently take Ubers, you may be familiar with this next case. When I lived in Portland, Oregon, and I was constantly going downtown, I wasn't really familiar with the city, especially. I found this one parking lot that I really, really loved, kind of like in a decent part of town, and I would always take an Uber to and from my car. And I just think every time I've traveled, I've gone to Las Vegas for work conferences, uh, New York. I mean, I have used so many Ubers in my lifetime, and every time something like this happens, it almost feels like it, it hits close to home, you know? And I'm sure I know some of you are with me on this. So back on March 29th of 2019, University of South Carolina student Samantha Josephson spent the night partying with her friends in the Five Points District in downtown Columbia. Her friends started to slowly leave, and around 2 a.m., Samantha decided the same. She was ready to go home. So she ordered an Uber. At 2.09 a.m., a black Chevy Impala is seen circling the block multiple times before pulling up to where she is standing on the sidewalk. She got in. Sadly, her body was then discovered 14 hours later by turkey hunters, roughly 65 miles away in a field. Now, this case isn't just another statistic of an Uber driver sexually assaulting or killing its rider. At its core, it's actually a case of mistaken identity. Samantha Josephson's Uber driver had actually arrived, but she did not get into their car. She had mistaken the black Impala driven by Nathaniel Rowland as her Uber ride and Uber driver. Rowland circled the block multiple times, saw her, pulled up, and she just got thinking that it was her Uber driver, you know, her Uber, got right in the car without a second thought. Unfortunately, this mistake would result in a violent attack. When Samantha got into Rowland's car, he immediately activated the child safety lock system on the doors, trapping her inside. Samantha and her friends utilized a certain app where they could constantly and, you know, see and keep up to date with where they were. Uh, they did this for safety purposes. And this app showed her traveling through multiple neighborhoods before the phone shut down at an intersection. At some point shortly thereafter, Nathaniel Rowland attacked Samantha Josephson. She was stabbed 120 times, primarily around the face and shoulders, but also on her back, legs, and feet. One wound went into her head with such force that it pierced her brain. Her carotid artery was severed. She had many defensive wounds, including one where a knife had gone completely through the palm of her hand. To say that this was a brutal attack would be a grave understatement. So Josephson's friends reported her missing the very next morning when she did not return home. And later that afternoon, Samantha Josephson's body was discovered. So the day after the attack, after police had been alerted, Nathaniel Rowland was driving around the Five Points area and was pulled over by police. He got out of his car, but he attempted to flee. So he was arrested at 3 a.m. on March 30th. And as they impounded his car and investigated it, investigators found a variety of incriminating items, uh, such as liquid bleach, germicidal wipes, window cleaner. They also found Samantha Josephson's phone, and perhaps the most obvious clue above all, her blood was still covering the passenger seat and trunk. The child's safety locks were still engaged. 
There are a lot more details, such as Rowan going back home, his girlfriend seeing him clean up blood from his car, um, blood from a knife, threatening to kill her. But this episode isn't about this case. Maybe in the future I will cover this case in its entirety. This is more about justice served. So Rowan's trial began on July 20th, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, The jury included seven women and five men. Prosecutors called 31 witnesses. And in something that I have actually never really seen before, the defense actually didn't call a single one. And just a couple days ago, on July 27th, Nathaniel Rowland was found guilty of the kidnapping and murder of Samantha Josephson after jurors deliberated for just one hour, just a little over one hour. And the judge immediately sentenced him to life in prison. What's so amazing, and one of my favorite parts of true crime, and it keeps me, because true crime is grim. It's very sad and emotional and intense to consistently read about brutal crimes, murders, rapes, assaults, cults. It can get a little taxing. And something that I absolutely love is when victims or families of victims, through all of their grief, try to affect change. And Samantha's parents did this as well. Through everything that they went through, They want to ensure that this cannot happen again, that at least make it harder for this to happen again. And so they founded the What's My Name Foundation, which educates people on ride-sharing safety. And they have frequently worked with actual lawmakers to strengthen already existing laws. They've assisted in the creation of new laws. All of this to ensure the safety of Uber and Lyft passengers, of ride-sharing passengers. So far, laws have been passed in South Carolina, New Jersey, North Carolina, New York, and even federally via the U.S. Congress, the United States Congress, which is absolutely amazing. Alrighty, so the next one, I guess this just wouldn't be me or this podcast if I didn't say her name, unfortunately, Um, but Lori Vallow case. So there's not a whole lot of movement in the Lori Vallow case, but there is one particular piece that's really interesting and has been very successful and fruitful with conversation and people trying to figure out what it means. Via the state of Idaho's iCourt portal, it became known that a judge has dismissed older charges with Chad and Lori. So they've actually dismissed some charges. Uh, That includes two counts of destroying evidence and two counts of conspiring to conceal evidence for Chad Daybell. And then Lori Vallow had her conspiracy charges dropped as well. Uh, The motions were made by prosecutor Rob Wood. But never fear, don't worry. Both of them still face the murder charges and the death of the kids plus Tammy. And that's And that's it for the Lori Vallow case. Just a little piece there. What do you think it means? A lot of people seem to think that this may be signaling or kind of prophesizing the death penalty going to be put on the table. And they're just trying to hone in and focus on the murders. Alrighty. So this next one may have flown past some of your radars. But we had another movie theater shooting on Monday, guys. Did you hear about it? And I'm just going to be completely honest here. I wish that I were lying to you, but I am actually personally very, very, very uncomfortable in movie theaters. I always immediately look for the exits. I just like my anxiety kicks in and I don't know why. You know, I know the statistics of mass shootings and everything, but still, for some reason, the the movie theater is just where my anxiety skyrockets. I know it's ridiculous, but sometimes our bodies just can't help our uh, flight or fight, I guess. So Monday night around 11.30 p.m., employees from the Corona California Theater entered the stadium to clean after a showing of The Forever Purge. You know, I think it's like God number like 87 in this uh, in this franchise, in this horror franchise. Still in their seats, they discovered 18-year-old Riley Goodrich and also Anthony Barajas. Riley was clearly deceased, having been shot in the back of the head at Point Blake Range, and Anthony was also shot but unconscious. So he was taken to the hospital where, unfortunately, he passed away August 1st. After reviewing footage from the movie theater, uh, police executed a search warrant at the home of 20-year-old Joseph Jimenez. They found a gun matching the caliber of the one used at the crime scene, as well as, apparently, other unknown evidence. He has been arrested. And it's just so senseless and tragic. And I don't know if any of you guys have, have followed this case or read it, but There are some people who you look at them and you just see nothing, just cold, nothing there, no soul staring back at you. Uh, Mr. Yemenez here is one of those people. You just kind of like look at a picture of him and you're like, oh, okay, well, that's not exactly surprising. 
And it's just you feel it coming from their eyes. The eyes are the windows to the soul. All right, and happier news. This news really tickles my fancy. It really gets me going. Piece of filth and scumbag rapist Harvey Weinstein. Now, I didn't know that there was exactly a kink that involved watching powerful men who rape and abuse women continuously get what they deserve. But alas, here we are. (laughs) And apparently it is the thing. So Weinstein was convicted of rape last year in New York and sentenced to 23 years in prison. Cool. Glad to see it. Love it. But he's now facing 11. That's 1-1. 11. 11 additional rape-related charges in the Beverly Hills and Los Angeles areas from five separate women. Now, his attorney attempted to get these charges, uh, which include rape, forced oral copulation, and sexual battery, thrown out due to the statute of limitations in California expiring. The judge actually ended up ruling against Weinstein on two of those charges and then asked the prosecutors to amend the sexual battery charge. So guys, what this means is that Weinstein is going back on trial. He's going back. He's going to go back to trial. And this, this is the trial that could put him away until his dying day because he's facing 140 years in prison. And whereas he won't likely receive the full penalty, um, This trial will absolutely be enough to ensure that he dies in prison. Because, I mean, let's face it, even if he died tomorrow, it wouldn't even be soon enough. I'm not even, I don't even feel guilty for saying that. He's what, 67 now? We've missed a lot of, a lot of time. So let's move on from one rapist to another. And this one's actually pretty historic. Former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick has been charged with sexually assaulting a teenage boy during a wedding reception in Massachusetts in 1974. This is huge news because Theodore McCarrick is the first cardinal in the U.S. to ever be criminally charged with a sexual crime against a minor. And guys, I'm 36 years old. I'm sitting here and I recall first hearing about Catholic, you know, sex abuse within the Catholic Church when I was a kid, like single digit age, single digit age. And it's also been, you know, a dark gallows humor type of joke for as long as I can remember as well. They even make fun of the Catholic Church on Saturday Night Live over it. And it's just mind-blowing to me that it's now 2021 and this has been so known about. It hasn't been a, it's been like the hidden open secret, I guess, but got so long it's been going on. And just now in 2021, he's the first cardinal. So McCarrick faces three counts of indecent assault and battery on a person over 14. McCarrick is now 91 years old, and interestingly enough, he was actually defrocked by Pope Francis in 2019 after the Vatican, the official Vatican team, investigated decades and decades and decades of rumors that he was molesting and assaulting young boys. And that's disgusting. It's also, it's just so revolting that the Vatican had reports dating all the way back to 1989, and they never did anything. They never did anything. That's, they only moved and did this sham investigation when it hit international media. So the Vatican held a two-year investigation that found that bishops, cardinals, and even the Pope downplayed or dismissed multiple reports of sexual misconduct. And they actually released, the Vatican released the internal report last year and actually put the lion's share, like the big proportion of the blame on Pope John Paul II. Pope John Paul II appointed McCarrick Archbishop of Washington, D.C., despite, despite the fact, knowingly, that he was a child predator. Now, you may be asking yourself, Robin, How can he be charged with a crime that happened in 1974? You know, we just talked about the Weinstein case and the whole statute of limitations thing. Interestingly enough, I'm glad you asked because that's because he was a cardinal in Massachusetts, but he never actually became a resident. So he left the state and went to Missouri where he currently lives and that officially stopped the clock. So we are waiting on him to be extradited. I know he's 91 years old, but he can rot for the rest of his life, however short that may be. Another like facet of this, another piece of this that I find really interesting is that the Catholic Church during this, right, like during its internal investigations and all that stuff, they've acknowledged that they have made previously undisclosed financial settlements with adults, now adults, who accused McCarrick of sexual misconduct decades ago. 
I mean, this actually dated his sex abuse cases back to the mid-1970s. So again, the Catholic Church, even up to the Pope, every level up to the Pope, knew that he was raping and molesting children and adults, both of them, both age ranges. And then they paid the victims off, but let him continue doing it. Alrighty, so next on the docket is a case that I am absolutely fascinated by, legally speaking. Uh, It's certainly not something that happens all that often. In 1985, babysitter Terry McCurchy pleaded no contest to attempted murder for shaking five-month-old Benjamin Dowling so horribly and violently that he suffered a brain hemorrhage. She was sentenced to And please sit down. Make sure you're sitting for this one. She shook a baby almost to death, caused him to suffer from a brain hemorrhage. And she was sentenced to spending weekends in jail for three months and three years of probation. I cannot. Benjamin Dowling did not recover from the injuries that he sustained. Uh, He dealt with debilitating mental and physical disabilities throughout his life and he needed 24-hour around-the-clock care. And here's the thing. Benjamin Dowling just passed away at age 35, and then Justice decided to come calling because Terry McCurchie was taken into custody at her home in Sugarland, Texas. Why? Because a Broward County grand jury in Florida indicted her with a first-degree murder charge. The prosecutors from Broward County said, quote, the passage of time between the injuries sustained and the death of the victim were considered by the forensic experts who conducted the autopsy and ruled the death was directly caused from the injuries from 1984. And McCurchie as well is currently awaiting extradition from Texas and has consistently maintained her innocence since the incident back in 1984. She actually faces life in prison if convicted. And I just find that so interesting that she was charged. She was sentenced to jail time, spending, I mean, spending the weekends there. And then here we are 36 years later, and she was arrested for his murder. Not every day that you see that in the, in the legal system. It wouldn't be a news update if I didn't mention also even casually that Rodney Alcala, who many of you may know as the dating game killer, he died. For those of you who aren't aware, he was sentenced to death in California. Uh, He committed eight murders between 1977 and 1979. And then he also pled guilty to two murders in New York, also in the early to late 1970s. He was a real absolute freak show. There are many, 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 many podcasts devoted to him. You can look it up online. But he apparently died of natural causes on July 24th. Had to mention it. All right. And for number 10, guys, for my 10th case here, and this is something that I want your feedback on. And in fact, I want you to let us know on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram um, on this episode's posting. Uh, I'm actually going to read the best replies on the next episode. I'm going to start doing that and reading uh, user feedback on our next episode. But Amanda Knox, I know that all of you, if you're on Twitter or read a lot of like news, that you've heard about this. So Amanda Knox, who many of you may know, uh, was the American student who studied abroad in Italy and basically became embroiled in and accused of the brutal murder of her roommate, like her housemate. She was held in Italy and then was convicted and then was acquitted. And now she is back in the United States. She is a very, very, very public figure. So Amanda Knox actually recently slammed the upcoming film Stillwater starring Matt Damon. It's loosely based on her infamous imprisonment in Italy. The movie is so based on her case, in fact, that Tom McCarthy, the director of the film, says, quote, There were so many characters around the case that I've really followed pretty closely. But really, the first thing that I took away from it was, what would it be like as an American student to go over to Europe for what should be one of the most exciting moments in a young adult life and to find yourself in that tragedy? And he has actually brought up Amanda Knox's name in multiple interviews, almost in every single interview. He discusses her case specifically. And Amanda Knox is very displeased, guys. If you haven't yet, I suggest going to Twitter. It's a very long thread. It has many tweets. But she started it off with, does my name belong to me? My face? What about my life? My story? Why does my name refer to events I had no hand in? I return to these questions because others continue to profit off my name, face, and story without my consent. 
most recently the film Stillwater. And McCarthy were kind of replied to uh, the outcry. He said, this is not the Amanda Knox story, just inspired. So how would you describe this? It's a tricky one to describe. I would say come and get lost in the movie. It goes places you don't expect. I hope engaging. Amanda Knox, though, says that, well, McCarthy, if the movie wasn't inspired by my story, then you should probably keep my name out of your mouth every single time you promote it. She says, quote, you're not leaving the Amanda Knox case behind very well if every single review mentions me. You're not leaving the Amanda Knox case behind when my face appears on profiles and articles about the film. And the reactions have been a mixed bag, to say the least. I could more appropriately call it an absolute shit show. One Twitter user, Paul Gray, said, quote, Sorry to be cynical, but this comes across as you're not happy about others profiting off your story unless you're profiting off it as well. I wouldn't suggest for a minute your life has been easy in the fallout from what happened, but bigger picture is that the true victim is Meredith. Others on Twitter are calling her a murderer. They are cursing at her, um, calling her a racist, a bigot. Basically, what you would expect from people trying to talk to Amanda Knox, a lot of people are not convinced of her innocence. I'm not going to get into the case because, again, it would take so long to do this case justice if we're getting into like every little piece of it. But more or less, she changed her story like five times and she immediately accused her boss, an African man, and then the second, which was a lie, and then the second person that she accused was an African man from the Ivory Coast and he actually ended up doing prison time for the murder. They found his DNA uh, at the scene and on her and it sounds like they most likely got the right guy there. But a lot of people are wondering if she's racist for lying right off the bat. And I mean, let's just be honest, she didn't exactly do herself any favors. I think that her case was really interesting just as a whole, too, because I haven't seen that amount of vitriol towards a person in a long time, especially one that most likely, you know, an American abroad, um, imprisoned. And, you know, how could she do this? She's a young, white, middle upper class student, you know, usually, usually the court of public opinion is pretty sympathetic to people like her. But you know, as her housemate's body was being wheeled out of the house on a stretcher, the dead body, mutilated body, she and her boyfriend were making out and canoodling and kissing, um, standing on the side of the road. It's a very interesting case. I personally do not believe that Amanda Knox had anything to do with the murder. Does she maybe know more? I don't know. Um, but either way, guys, Twitter is an absolute shit show. Highly suggest you head over there and just go to Amanda Knox's Twitter profile, read this entire thread. She goes on for quite a bit more. She has definitely set it off. But likewise, a lot of people are actually supporting her. They're telling her to sue the cast and crew, the production crew, uh, or even offering just to support her in a boycott. But I want to know how you feel about it. I'll again, let us know on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram your thoughts, and I will be reading the best replies on the next episode. Do you think that Amanda Knox has a right to be upset about this? You know, she was brought into something and dragged into something through no fault of her own, basically, more or less. And should she be upset that they are making a movie based on her experience? Other than the people calling her a murderer, I think a lot of people who are looking at this are thinking, um, you literally came back here, started a podcast, you've been on many documentaries, you did the news circuit immediately, like you have made yourself a public figure. So how can you even be upset about this? And then other commenters have been like, sounds like you yourself want to profit and it has nothing to do with the memory of Meredith Kircher. So which is it? You can't have it both ways. It's really fascinating, though, but I want to know what you guys think. So hit us up or even email it to info at we saw the devil. But that is it for today, guys. I just wanted to have 10 quick news stories that I found interesting over the last week. If you have any, think of any that I missed that you found particularly interesting, definitely email them over to info at we saw the devil, and I will see about reading those and taking care of those on a future episode. Again, you can find us at we saw the devil.com as well as we saw the devil across all social media. If you're feeling fancy and very generous, please head over to Apple iTunes or Apple Podcasts, as it were, and leave us a five-star review. That would be greatly appreciated. And then, too, if you're really digging the show and you want to financially back it, check us out on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil. Again, for as little as $3 a month, you can get a wide variety of benefits. 
including ad-free episodes, which I know a lot of people particularly like, t-shirts, stickers, postcards, a private Facebook group, and so forth. I have some cool stuff coming out this week, guys, so stay tuned. And until next crime.